Well, good morning, everyone. I guess it's time to get started. It's good to see you all here today. Um, weather's looking a little bit warmer outside, right? It's snowing? Ugh. Dave and I got here early and did all the shoveling and stuff. We haven't been outside since, so thank, thanks for that great news. Great news. Wonderful. So again, welcome. <laughs> so I have, an, I have a nice little note here from Donnie and Ada. Um, we've been concerned about them. We haven't seen them, and we know Donnie's been waiting on a transplant. But he says, we are doing super well, snug as, at, snug as, as bears in a den. We hope you are all well as well and that you have yourself a Merry Christmas time. So it was really great to hear from them. Other announcements, prayer requests, concerns, anything people would like to show? Yes, Dell. The envelopes are in the back. Okay, the uh, offertory envelopes are in the back. Please, if you got one back there with your name on it, please pick it up. What else we got? Ruth Ann. Yep, we're praying for Luke Wellen. He was here for a little while this morning with his nice sore ribs. But he, he's up and about, he's doing better. Christmas Eve. Well, Dave was announcing that one, but fine. Christmas Eve, the registrations for Christmas Eve service are starting to fill up. So if you want to come, you need to call Amy pretty soon, 532-4321-607 area code for all those out there in Arizona land and Texas and Florida and Georgia where they're watching us live streaming. Well, wait, we're not live streaming this service, but it will be on YouTube. Yeah, I'm the tech guy. Great <laughs> failure. What else do we have? Not seeing any hands? Yes, my job is done. I'll turn it over to Pastor Dave. Your job has only begun. <laughs> good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you this morning. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us for worship today. Uh, it's just so good to be here and to be in this beautiful sanctuary on the fourth Sunday of Advent and be able to worship God, just considering the gift of his son. The word Advent, as I said, means coming. And so during this time, we're remembering the fact that God has come to us. Uh, we're also looking forward to the time when Jesus will come again. But thankfully, in the meantime, God is with us. That's what Emmanuel means. God is with us. And that really is the promise of Christmas, the promise that he made that he would be with us. And so I found in uh, the hymn book a little reading, which was part of a song I used to play some 40-some years ago on CBN, it was a Gaither song, and they would read this and then sing this beautiful song, and I just wish I could play and sing that for you, but I'm just going to read this part for you this morning as a call to worship, reminding us of what God has done. Right from the beginning, God's love has reached, and from the beginning, man has refused to understand. But love went on reaching, offering itself. Love offered the eternal. We wanted the immediate. Love offered deep joy. We wanted thrills. Love offered freedom. We wanted license. Love offered communion with God himself. We wanted to worship at the shrine of our own minds. Love offered peace, but we wanted approval for our wars and conflicts. Even yet, love went on reaching. And still today, after 2,000 years, patiently and lovingly, Christ is reaching out to us today, right through the chaos of our world, through the confusion of our minds. He is reaching longing to share with us the very being of God. His love is still longing. His love is still reaching. 
right past the shackles of my mind. And the word of the Father became Mary's little son. And his love reached all the way to where I was. As we come to worship him this morning, I would remind you that his love has reached all the way to where you are. Right, right past your confusion, right past your brokenness, right past your hurt and pain, his love reaches past our minds and into our hearts. And so that's why we've come here today, to worship God in spirit and in truth from our hearts. Let's take a moment now and open our service with prayer this morning. Father, we're so grateful that we can come here to this place and worship you. We're still allowed to come into our sanctuary to gather together and pray and, and praise you and worship you. We're still allowed to experience your presence, your mercy, forgiveness, and grace in this place. And so, as we consider, consider the fact that you have given us the gift of your Son. As we consider uh, the fact that you've given us your Word and your Holy Spirit, you've given so much to us. And that you've even promised to be present with us during this time. We just want to say, we welcome you. We welcome you into this place, into our hearts, into our lives, and invite you to have your way in every heart and in every life this morning. We're thankful for those who've gathered here in this place this morning. We're thankful for those who are watching us by means of computer or a smartphone. That they're worshiping with us this morning too. I ask that your presence and mercy and grace would extend to those who join us as well. May we know the peace that only you can give and your mercy and grace in our lives. Lord, uh, we have a, a, a number of people who we've been praying for, and we do pray for Luke, and we pray for healing and for patience, for your provision, for peace of heart and mind. We also pray for our dear friend Bill, who recently lost Sally. And I know, I can only imagine, the heartache, the hurt, the sense of loss and sorrow, but we pray that you would comfort him in a way that only you can. That he might know that he's not truly alone because you are present with him. Bring your comfort, your peace of mind, your grace to him. Be with Bonnie and Bill through her sickness. Bring health and healing to her. Continue to heal up Joan and bless her and be present with her. We pray for Joyce and her son Dan for your comfort, for your healing, for your touch, for your presence in their lives and for Bob for continued healing in his leg. For the family of Eleanor Miller who um, also has that same hurt and pain and sense of loss May they know the comfort of God in their hearts and in their lives. And Lord, for all the other requests, spoken and unspoken, for the request of those who are watching us now, joining with us, we pray that you would touch, that you would move, that you would work in their hearts, in their lives, in their families. All of us have a, a certain amount of brokenness and challenges that we face and chaos that we live with. I pray that you'd meet us in the midst of these storms and calm the storm the same way that Jesus did when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee. May the waves go down. May the wind die down. May we find the peace and power in your presence that we need and that we long for. 
And now, Father, we pray as Jesus himself taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We're going to continue our worship this morning with some special music. Please worship God as you listen. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now if the Advent uh, wreath readers would please get into position and do your reading for us this morning as we continue our worship. morning. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent. Our hope is that as the days of Christmas are counted down, you will keep Jesus as the center and the greatest treasure of the Advent season. Christmas trees and gifts have their place, but let's make sure that in all the December rush and hubbub, we take time to adore Jesus above all else. That's exactly what the wise men did as they followed the star to find the newborn king. Let's read from the Bible, Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2, 7 through 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. 
Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went down their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. Each of the gifts that the wise men brought had a special meaning. Gold stood for the riches of the king. Jesus would be the king of kings. Incense was used by the priests in temple worship. Jesus would be our high priest, mediating between us and God. Myth was a perfume put on dead people. Jesus would die on the cross as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. The wise man's gifts showed that Jesus would be king, priest, and sacrifice. For the last three Sundays, we lit candles on the Advent wreath. They represent God's gift to us. Here, I'll hold it. Hope. Peace and joy. It's fussy. It's fussy. Very. Today we light the fourth candle that represents his love. Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. The Christ child that received the worship and gifts of the Magi would one day give his life for their sins and for ours. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you willingly gave your life for me. Nothing I give to you could ever repay you for what you did. So Jesus, I offer you my life. Lord, all that I am and have is yours. In your precious name, amen. Thank you so much. Now at this time we'd like to have the pleasure of singing a couple of Christmas carols. So if you've been here before, you know the drill. We're going to uh, line up around the perimeter of the sanctuary, socially distance best as you can, and sing into the open space in the middle of the sanctuary. We're going to begin with O Little Town of Bethlehem. And uh, thank you so much for your participation.
seated. It feels good to praise the Lord in song. It sure does. It sure does. It sure does. I just wanted to mention before I begin our message for today uh, that the Christmas Eve services are filling up, especially the 7 o'clock service. Uh, uh, So if you would like to come, you're probably looking at the 5 o'clock service mostly at this point. There may be a couple spots left at 7, but they're filling up and... uh, uh, We're just grateful. It's a special time uh, to worship God on Christmas Eve. uh, And there'll be special music, and we're going to try and sing again, and uh, and, uh, just honor Christ and celebrate the gift of God's one and only Son to us. As always, it's a pleasure and honor and a privilege to be, for me, to be able to be here and share God's Word with you. I I love God's Word, I'm passionate about God's Word, and uh, I'm glad that there's someone here to listen to me talk about God's Word. Ruth Ann probably gets tired of me uh, talking all the time about it, but it's especially uh, special during Advent because we're considering that promise of Christmas, that promise that he would be with us. That's what we looked at the first week, uh, how uh, through his prophets long ago, God promised to be with us, and he fulfilled that promise, he kept that promise when he sent his one and only son. And then the next week, we looked at the idea that, that God promised to be with us, and God always keeps his promises. Not one of his words has ever failed. All of his promises always come true, so if God said it, that settles it. Or God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God always keeps his promises. And then uh, last week we looked at the idea, well, God promised to be with us, and God is with us, and if God is with us, it will change our lives. You cannot spend time, you cannot commune with the living God without it having an impact on your life. It will change your life. God loves us too much to leave us the way we are because the way we are, our sin nature, our natural tendencies lead to destruction. But God loves us too much to leave us that way. Instead, He cleans us up. He changes us from the inside out. Makes us fit for heaven so that we can be with him and live with him forever and ever throughout all eternity. He changes us not for a moment, but for all eternity. And today, we're going to look at the thought, God has come to us so that we may come to him. You see, there was a vast separation between God, our maker, and us, and this occurred when Adam and Eve chose to listen to the enemy, chose to do what they wanted, chose to do things their way instead of God's way, deliberately disobeying God and God's word and brought this huge separation. The Bible calls it sin. But there's a huge separation between mankind and God because of sin. And we could blame Adam and Eve, except for every one of us has made that same decision in our life to choose to do things my way instead of God's way. And it sets us at odds with God. It separates us from God. We're far apart from God. And if you could measure that distance in miles, it'd probably be more than a million miles. But the distance is not in miles. It's the distance that's caused because of sin. And that's why I say God has come to us so that we may come to him. He's traveled that great distance and come to us and and provided a way to deal with our sin so that now we can come to him. He's come a million miles to us. Can we take one step toward him? And so as we consider this thought today, we're going to look 
at the most familiar text of all in Luke chapter 2, about the birth of Christ, about the announcement of the angels, and about the response of the shepherds. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in claws and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace. Goodwill to men. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word, the gift of your word, which tells us of all of your wonderful promises to us, including the promise of the gift of your son, the word made flesh who came and lived among us. And so as we consider the gift of your word and the gift of your son, we ask that the gift of your Holy Spirit would come. Once again, opening our ears to hear our eyes to see, and Holy Spirit, touch our hearts in such a way that we can believe and receive all you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. God has come to us so that we may come to him. God has come to us so that we may come to him. Now, as you consider what we talked about the last few weeks, as you dig into the, 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 the prophecies and the stories about the gift of God's Son, uh, I'll, I'll note in, in just in summary here that God had promised that Messiah would be born of a virgin. And Jesus was born of a virgin. We read that story a couple of weeks ago. God promised that, that the Messiah would be born into the house and line of David. And we can see in the New Testament that in the genealogy in Luke, we have the, uh, the genealogy of Mary, and in Matthew, we have the genealogy of Joseph. And so uh, Jesus has every right to sit on the throne of David because he is related by birth through Mary, by adoption through Joseph, he has a right to the royal line and to the royal throne. 
Messiah had to be born into the right family, into the right place, and be born of a virgin. And Jesus qualified in all of these ways. If someone were born today and claimed to be Messiah, well, you could not document it because the genealogical records have all been uh, wiped out. They were wiped out in AD 70. You could never reconnect those records. Nobody born today. Some people are still waiting for Messiah to appear. But if someone today claimed the Messiah to be the Messiah, they could not prove that they were in the right family, in the royal line. But Jesus was in the right line. The Messiah also had to be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. In the birth of Jesus, all of the prophecies were fulfilled. He was born of a virgin. He was in the house of David. He was born in Bethlehem. In verse 6, we learn that while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. So while I don't have a specific scripture in the Old Testament predicting the time that Jesus would be born, I believe that all of these things are true. Jesus had to be born in the right place, at the right time, in the right family, and all these prophecies, predictions, promises were fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Now, God has been speaking through his prophets, through his angels. He's been moving people back and forth into position so that every promise will be kept. Now he had the right family and Mary was going to bring Jesus into the world, deliver Jesus into the world, if you will. The problem was She lived in the wrong town. She lived in Nazareth, which was about 60 miles away. It's like being up in Rochester, this side of Rochester, maybe Victor. They lived up there. So God simply moved upon Caesar Augustus, put it in his heart, to take a census so that he could raise a tax. Now, who said that God can't use governmental tactics to accomplish his will? It wasn't me, but he did do it back then. And so Joseph and Mary had to travel on a donkey about 60 miles on foot and on a donkey to Bethlehem so that Jesus, the Messiah, could be born in Bethlehem. I would say it would be a little inconvenient to be fully pregnant, like someone who is here this morning, and have to travel 60 miles on a dog. No wonder the scripture says the time came for the baby to be born. After doing that, it would be time for the baby to be born. And now that you've served as my illustration for this morning, you can go ahead and have the baby any time you would like. Now. <laughs> On my, my first Christmas here, I talked about how Ruth Ann used to allow our little children to uh, decorate the tree. And then when they went to bed, she would go over and move all of the ornaments to the places where she thought they should be. But God does the same thing with us. We set up the nativity. I had Thomas put the sheep where he thought they should be and the shepherds and the wise men. God takes all of these pieces and moves them into place so that every prophecy will be fulfilled and every promise will be kept. He moved Mary and Joseph 60 miles to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born in Bethlehem and the promise would be fulfilled. May I mention to you this morning that God may do the same thing in your life. He may move you. He may cause things to happen to your life that's inconvenient for you. 
and uncomfortable for you. It's not always convenient and comfortable when God is attempting to accomplish his purpose in our lives. Sometimes pain and suffering are even involved. And yet, through it all, God will be glorified. His word will be true. His promise will be fulfilled. And he may use you to touch somebody else's life through the experiences that you go through. This is why I say God has come to us so that we may come to him. He comes to us and then he brings us to him so that his purpose can be accomplished in our lives. Now, after Jesus was born, God sends his angels to announce this good news, that a Savior is born, that God is with us. And I ask, well, why did God tell the angels? Now, we talked about over these past weeks how uh, Gabriel appeared to uh, Zechariah. And then Gabriel appeared to Mary. Well, Mary needed to know that she was going to have this baby. She really had a need to know. An angel appeared to Joseph in his dreams, and he needed to know. But my question is, why did these shepherds need to know? I mean, the appearance of an angel uh, are fairly rare occurrence. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't even happen every day in the Bible, and yet uh, surrounding the, the birth of Christ, we have four different appearances of angels, and these angels came to announce this good news to the shepherds, and why did the shepherds need to know? And I've asked a question that I really can't answer, but I have some thoughts about it. Uh, Abraham, who originally received the promise from God, was a shepherd. And Isaac was a shepherd, and Jacob was a shepherd, and the, and the, the uh, children of Jacob in Egypt were all shepherds. In fact, they were shepherds in the land of Goshen. And Moses did time as a shepherd when he was in the wilderness with his father-in-law Jethro, and even David... King David, one of the most famous of all. He also was a shepherd as a little boy. And so I think that God has a closeness with these shepherds and he thought they should be the first to know, but he also wanted someone else besides Mary and Joseph to be a witness to this. Sometimes I wonder if maybe Luke got to interview the shepherds and got this story actually from one of the shepherds and wrote it down, and we can read it today. But I think the real reason that God, that this story is included for us, it's not that the angels told the shepherds, but it is the response that the shepherds had. See, the shepherds, they were out in the field, and the angel appears to them and says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. It says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us, which the Lord has told us about. Uh, there's something special about the shepherds in that when they heard the good news, they responded to it. They didn't just say, oh, well, that's nice to know. That's an interesting story. I'll look it up on Google later. They heard the good news. And they responded to it. They said, let's go see. Let's go see. Let's go experience this. God has come to us so that we may come to him. And that's what the shepherds did. They heard the good news. They left their sheep. They went and found the baby lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths. And then they went and they told everybody about it. And I think, 
I think that's how we are supposed to respond. When we hear the good news, we shouldn't say, oh, that's interesting, I'll do something about that later. I'll look it up later. I'll think about it later. When we hear the good news about the Savior, about the fact that God is with us, about the fact that God has come to us, he's traveled a million miles to us, and all we need to do is just take one step closer to him. Take the little key that's keeping your heart shut turn that key and open your heart to him. He is at the door and knocks. He wants to come in and sup with you. He's traveled so far to come to us, but it's still necessary for us to come to him. And how do we do that? Well, we come to him in the same way that he came to us, lowly and in humility. How do we come to him? Well, we don't wait until we're perfect to come to him. The shepherds didn't go back to their houses, take a shower and put on some deodorant and go and find the baby. They went to him the way they were. And that's how we're to come to him. The songwriter wrote, just as I am. That's how you come to God, just the way you are. If you wait until you're perfect, You never will come because you'll never be perfect. We come to him humbly. We come to him the way we are. We come to him in our brokenness and in our pain and through our suffering. We come to him because we need him. We come to him because we know he loves us because of what he has done for us. He's come so far to be with us. It's also up to us to take that one step, to open our hearts and to welcome him the rest of the way home. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful that you have come to us. Help us now. Help us now in our own way to come to you to bow the knee of our heart, to acknowledge that we're sorry for our sin, for for going our own way and doing our own thing for so long. We recognize, Father, that your way is better. May the Christ of Christmas, Emmanuel, the God who is with us, Inhabit and fill our hearts and lives today. Help us to take that step out of our darkness into your light. Out of our pain and brokenness. Into the wholeness that you have for us. We welcome you. You've come to us. We open our arms and say, Lord, you're welcome here. In our hearts. In our lives. Have your way, we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. I just wanted to say thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, Because of your faithful giving, we've been able to refurbish the organ this year. Uh, We've replaced the uh, roof on the parsonage. We've uh, 
taken care of some trees that were kind of half dead outside. Uh, many, many projects that have been done thanks to your faithful giving. We've upgraded the sound system. We have a new camera and we're even broadcasting live every Sunday. This last week uh, alone, I've heard of people in Florida who are watching. Another family in Georgia who watches with us, someone from Texas is watching. Uh, North Carolina people are watching every week. I have a sister in Maine who tunes in occasionally. And I know people from Ovid and Interlaken and Lodi and some of the folks who are at home who it's difficult for them to come out, but they can watch online. And, and so we're grateful uh, because of your faithful giving, we've been able to do this. And we're grateful to those of you who choose to join us in worship and welcome the Christ of Christmas into your hearts and into your homes. So thank you for your faithfulness. And now let us pray. Father, we're grateful. Grateful that you're expanding the ministry of this church through the gifts of these people. That uh, you enable us to shine your light and share your love in this place. And the light shines not only in this building, but outside the walls to this building, even to other states and other places and other communities. And so we just invite you to continue uh, to be glorified through us, through your faithful servants, through those who give, through those who serve, through those who, who share their gift of music. Lord, you've given so much to us, and so we just take a moment to give back to you this morning. And help us in everything we do to lift up the name of Jesus, the wonderful gift that you have given to us, the gift of your one and only Son, who has changed and transformed our lives forever. So we ask that you use these gifts for your glory, that you bless those who've given, and that you continue to rule in and reign in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so wonderful to have you here with us today, to see your faces, to know that you're doing well uh, in spite of the challenges that we all face through daily life. It's a comfort to know that God has come to us, that he is with us through the good times and through the difficult times as well. We're especially aware of his presence, of his love, of his mercy and grace during the difficult times. It's then that we're aware how much we need him. But he loves you so much that he gave his one and only son for you. He's the one who knows you best and loves you most and has provided a way for you to get to know him better, to belong to his family. So just know that you're loved by God, you're loved by us here at the Interlake and Reformed Church. And I encourage you to go forth and love each other the way that he has loved you. And now, may the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence and power of his Holy Spirit be with you today and every day. Amen and amen. <laughs>